Well, we got a very special guest uh, today. If, if you know what that's a reference to, uh, do you know what that's a reference to? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Uh, Nine Club, if you ever watched that. Never heard of it. Uh, it's like a skateboarding podcast. But anyway, so we got Matt, uh, which maybe some of you guys probably know. I mean, considering that probably the only people who are going to watch this are from the MIA server anyway. So how's it going? Hey, guys. What's up? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Um, <laughs> wow, I'm so awkward. Like, I've never done an interviewee kind of... I mean, I guess we can just, like, do what we were doing before, except it happens to be recorded, so... <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you mean. Like, this actually always happens to me when I film the interviews, where I'll be talking to the person, and it will feel totally natural, and then the second that it's time to do the intro to the actual interview when we're recording, <laughs> I totally, like... I'm awkward as fuck. And actually, I, oftentimes I end up retaking it like 10 times. I'd be like, okay, no, I have to do it again. I have to do it again. Yeah, yeah. I remember so, like yeah. th- there was okay. one with yoga where it was the one that had the Star Wars um, mm-hmm. thumbnail. And you guys did like a, I don't know, a blooper take. <laughs> Just how many oh, times yeah. you had to retake yeah. it. That one was extra bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, how's it been going? Um, I mean, obviously you're still busy with Chinese. So uh how are you having fun? Um, what's it like and stuff? Uh, yeah, it's pretty fun. It's a uh, kind of a roller coaster, I guess, because uh, some things are different than learning Japanese. A lot of things are the same. I'm really different than when I was learning Japanese, so yeah, that uh, make can make it interesting. I mean, I guess like back then you had like being a weeb and like cute anime girls to like always keep you like <laughs> engaged or whatever. I guess like as an adult, it's like a little bit harder to. Uh, I don't know, block out the rest of the world just to, like, focus on watching TV. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the biggest thing I had when I was learning Japanese that I don't have now is the idea that learning this language is going to somehow make my life way better than it is right now. Yeah, definitely. Where I know that ultimately that's not the case, so... It's actually funny, like, on what I prepared, like, this is probably the the vast majority of the topics prepared. (laughs) Is this kind of stuff. Cool. Well, yeah, I like yeah. talking about that type of stuff. I think it's important to talk about. Yeah, definitely. Because um, I feel like the people on the server, it's like, this is the kind of questions they should probably be asking themselves. So I guess before we jump into all of that, uh, on the last one, I got one question, um, which I wanted to answer, which was, how do you balance your degree and your hobbies with finding time for MIA? And I guess like, that's also about like friends and family and like trying to, I don't know, keep it all balanced. So I guess, uh, do you have anything that you want to say about that? Hmm. Well, I've never exactly been a man of balance, so yeah. I don't know if I'm the best guy to come to that with. But yeah, definitely. I mean, well, the way that I'm approaching Chinese right now is that it's definitely not the center of my life. It's pretty much something that I do on the side. It's a hobby. I mean, I put a lot of time into it for a hobby, like yeah. a couple hours a day sometimes, but ultimately i don't view it as the centerpiece of my life so if i get yeah. busy with something or something else comes up i'm quick to skip out on it for a day or two and of course the speed at which i progress is negatively affected by that but i'm okay with that because it is what it is yeah. so if you take that type of approach i don't think it should be be too difficult uh just you know decide how much time you're going to allocate and allocate that much time and figure out how much time it takes you to do well in university and just use your time wisely if you want to get better as fast as possible like i was doing when i was learning japanese then it's in a way it's even more simple it's just spend the bare amount of bare minimum amount of time possible on university stuff and then just spend every other second you have doing japanese stuff yeah so i mean i'm probably closer to that um in such a way that i don't feel like i'm well i'm kind of like doing the bare minimum to keep sane um because I don't feel like I am as uh, single-minded as you were when you were in your golden days. Because um, for me, like, I think I probably get like six hours a day, probably. Maybe a little bit more sometimes. But like, there's a lot of procrastination and like playing mobile games. Not that much, but, uh, you know, I- I'm not like totally against taking breaks and just being chill about it. But um, yeah, for me, like, I had a class average for maths of, like, 38% <laughs> this semester. And with the final exam, I managed to bump it up f- to 51. And in my country, it's like, if you get 50% or above, you pass. So I was like, I just scraped through everything, basically. As like, even when I was studying, um, 
like for my math exam i studied for two days before my math exam and i was studying for like eight hours a day but i was still like going kikisen in like japanese discord servers and getting lots of passive listening while studying so i'm probably not the best person to ask about this either because i'm pretty stupid when it comes to that kind of stuff but uh yeah i mean i guess at the end of the day how i would go about it is yeah you either have to decide that you're gonna spend a certain limited amount of time on language learning or you're going to spend all your free time on language learning and yeah. either way it's not too difficult if you decide you're going to spend a limited amount of time then look at your whole life decide realistically how much time you can and are willing to spend and then only spend that amount of time on it and if you want to take the other approach then just minimize everything else and just spend every remaining second you have on it so either way it's i don't think there's any pretty magic simple to yeah it. I, I think like for me the biggest like uh thing that i've done was just changing the the language that i consume media in because to me it's like why would i watch something in english and not learn something because like i understand like the majority of stuff i watch in japanese obviously i don't go out of my way to like watch science fiction or like stuff that would put me back into like uh this the kind of mindset of what it was like to be a beginner like i try to keep stuff that makes me feel hyped up on how much i am understanding but it's like it, it feels so, like to uh like why would i watch something in english and not get better at japanese and it's like, I'm still just having fun and watching TV and stuff. And I think like you almost like use MIA as like a way to justify doing fun stuff in the middle of your life, I guess. For me, like that's definitely how I've approached it. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, like, I definitely it, did that for a, yeah. a long while when I was learning Japanese. That was what I did for a while. I don't really have that mindset anymore. I think it kind of broke down with Japanese where I got to the point where I reached a level where improving was really difficult. Yeah. So realistically, spending an hour watching YouTube videos in Japanese wasn't going to improve my Japanese. And it became clear that I was literally just wasting time. So it kind of broke <laughs> down. And yeah. then I, I just haven't installed it with Chinese yet because I don't really understand enough for for it to be the an equivalent type of thing. You know, it's like when I do something in Chinese, I still understand so little that it feels like I'm language learning. You know, it yeah, doesn't feel like yeah. I'm just enjoying the plot or learning something. So it's a little different. I mean, something that I was I was speaking to somebody today, and maybe I'll talk a little bit about that later, because um, I think I might have actually managed to red pill somebody, but that's a whole other thing. Um, but anyway, like something that I was thinking is like I didn't end up reading Yotsuba and like all of the the easy stuff that you're supposed to read when you suck, right? And I kind of feel like I should have because now I'm too good to really justify reading it. <laughs> so it's like. You know, I, I feel like I've um, missed out on, like, this part of, like, the, the shared Japanese learning, like, the experience, you know, <laughs> if that makes any yeah. sense. Well, I didn't consume any of those things either, but I never felt like I missed out on anything because, I mean, I never cared about having the same journey as other people. Like, I don't care yeah, what other not. Japanese learners are doing. I don't yeah. care if they like Yotsuba. I never knew what Yotsuba was until I started making videos and stuff. So, I think, <laughs> in, in, in a sense, that's kind of silly. But uh, the other point that I would make is one thing that I realized pretty late in my Japanese journey was that I was always trying to consume something that would challenge me in a very direct way in the sense of there would be words I didn't know, there would be structures that, you know, were difficult for my mind to comprehend. And so I could feel that my cutting edge was being pushed forward through consuming that piece of media. But one thing that I kind of missed and was kind of a blind spot was that you also have to take a lot of time to consume things that are easy for you to get kind of the muscle memory built in, to get the yeah. effortlessness built in. And so I would say it's probably still good. Like you're, I would say you're probably not at the point where you can't justify reading Yotsuba or whatever, because no, but it's like you're compared still be, to reading yeah. like something else. It just feels like it's less value for time, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I know that feeling, but I think to an extent you have to also probably it's a good idea to go out of your way to allocate some time to doing things that are quote unquote yeah, yeah, easy definitely. to get the, just the muscle memory built up. Cause when you think about like, I know I noticed for a long time with Japanese, there were things where like, yeah, I could read it and understand it a hundred percent, no problem. But if I compared it to English, English was so much easier and more effortless. It, yeah. it was like, it read itself when my eyes touched the page or something. And to get to that point, you have to spend a lot of time reading easy things. Yeah, definitely. So. Okay, and, yes. and the trap you can fall into is that, you're never going to run out of things that are hard for you to read like ever. And I just pursued that path way too long to the point where I was reading stuff that was written like over a hundred years ago and Japanese people can't even read. So at some point you got to kind of cut it off, you know, and yeah. instead focus on mastering what you already can understand. But I mean, for me, it's not so much like I don't want to do stuff that's easy, but it's like, 
I don't want to go out of my way to do it either. Because it's like, if there's a show I really want to watch and it happens to be easy, it's like, you know, that's not really an issue. I want to watch like, uh, like, you know, those Jeru videos, of, I think that's his name, whatever. Like, they're pretty funny and pretty interesting and I enjoy watching them and they're not really that challenging. I'm not going to like beat myself up for watching them. Um, I don't know. It's like, I think like having a good balance of uh, stuff that makes you grow and stuff that's just like, I think easy stuff as well kind of uh, keeps your your reward system going. It makes you feel like you're you're pretty good, even if it's like you know, <laughs> not even that hard. But yeah, yeah. It makes you feel like wow, I can consume stuff that's made for natives and understand it and stuff. I think for me, I did that with spoken media because yeah, there'd be shows that I just wanted to watch even if it was easy. Yeah. But I think with reading books because there's always more of an inherent effort to reading a book. Yeah. I wouldn't want to read a book that was easy for me. It would felt like. It would feel like a waste of time because reading a book takes so long, right? Like 10 plus hours, maybe 20 plus hours. So it would feel like this book is too easy. I can't afford to put 20 hours into this. And I wouldn't. But that's something that I would have changed going back. I would have probably alternated between reading an easy book and then reading a challenging book. I actually just did that. Only challenging books. Yeah, because I just finished reading the first volume of Ori more. And like, there was like a lot of hard words in that, even though it's like relatively like compared to like a real book, it's not as hard. But then it's like I showed some words that I was making sentence cards to some natives and they were like, well, I don't know that word. Or it's like, at least they couldn't define it or, you know. But I suppose like that doesn't really say very much. But it's not like te taraku or whatever. It's like, it, it is like words for me that I hadn't seen before. And it's like, then I, I thought like, oh, that was a little bit of a drag. Oh, and I also finished reading Zerono Tsukaima, which obviously had a whole bunch of really useless words that I made cards for anyway, because, yeah, I probably shouldn't have. <laughs> um... So yeah, I, I want to read something easy this time. So I'm reading like the the yeah, third by the way, I don't know if Oreimo is that much easier than a real novel. I mean, it's mostly just different. But I know, like I've read, I read the first volume of Oreimo, and yeah, there was a ton of really obscure vocabulary. Yeah, probably more than a lot of novels. <laughs> it's just kind of different because it's written in the first person, and it's written as if he's just talking to you. And yeah. so, in a way it's easier if you're not used to more literary style grammar structures and like narrative structure. But in another way, it probably has more obscure vocabulary than most general yeah, normal maybe. novels. So I mean, kind of just different. So. Yeah, definitely. I think like for me, Toradora was really hard at first because it wasn't as like, uh, I don't know, um, spoken, if that makes sense. Like it was a little bit more like using metaphors to describe stuff and like more liter literary in that way. Like, somebody was about to sit down in their seat and then they use the word chakuriku for that <laughs> it's like i made a card for that but um that was a huge hurdle for my comprehension at first because it just felt like i understood some of the words in that sentence and yeah even if there were ones that i didn't it's like um having to like bend your comprehension and like it's really hard to picture it first where there's just like you're not used to uh passing it <laughs> yeah definitely especially like, for me, I was never really a fiction reader before I started learning Japanese. So, for me, it was kind of a process of just learning how to read fiction in general and yeah. learning how to read Japanese kind of at the same time. Yeah. When it comes to picturing it in your head and stuff like that. Because that's actually something that I've been thinking of. It's, like, I think probably the best way, especially when you're new to reading, is to literally, for each, like, piece of information, like, you have a scene in, like, your mind's eye, and that each new thing is just, like, updating your, your mental image of what's happening. And then obviously, if you don't understand a word, it's like, you're just, it's just one piece of the scene that's missing. But because you still have your mental image, you, you know, everything that comes later, you at least have like some frame of reference to make it comprehensible. Whereas like, if you just try to go one sentence at a time and just like brute force it, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> yeah. I'm, and I did that. Like I've heard, heard you talk about that piece of advice. I think it's a really useful piece of advice. And I... I mean, I wasn't really conscious of it, but I implicitly was doing that in my head of like, what does this word add to the overall meaning? And that, it, it, sometimes it would feel like if I didn't do that, I would just gloss over a word and it would kind of feel like I understood it, but maybe not really because it wasn't really adding to my understanding of what was happening in the scene. But I think there's also certain times, and it took me a long time to realize this, but you know, when the author is writing or describing, I should say, a physical scene where there's a certain room or a certain layout and characters are moving around within this physical, uh, you know, environment. He has a vision of what that looks like in his head and he's trying to describe it with words. But a lot of times they just don't do that good of a job and they don't 
describe it enough to the point where you start reading it and you picture <laughs> yeah. something slightly different than what the author was envisioning. And then it just doesn't add up. And it's not really your fault. It's not that you misinterpreted the text. It's just that there was multiple interpretations of part of the text. And then the other part didn't fit one of those interpretations. And so you just end up like with them being confused about what was physically happening. Yeah. Especially with action scenes. Like I remember when I read um, Excel World, the first volume, and they go into these like martial arts combat scenes where in terms of like his arm did this, his leg did that and all this stuff. And it was just like, I could, I understood each sentence, but I couldn't really piece it together in my head. And I remember watching the, like going back and like trying to find that scene in the actual anime to see, well, what are the people who turned into an anime? What was their interpretation of it? But yeah. I think a lot of times it's just like, it, it will even happen in English. Now I notice sometimes if I read a physical scene in an English book, it will still be pretty hard to, comprehend so don't i'm just saying don't be too hard on yourself because you never know if it's your fault or the author's fault yeah definitely it's good to assume that it's your fault in general, <laughs> but yeah yeah um i also feel like some, something i've been doing is uh with shield hero which obviously i think all of that became popular a little bit after you got out of uh i don't know the scene of yeah, i've never even heard yeah, of that. yeah um well actually i've heard of it because i've heard yeah, other people talk about it's it, like an really isekai it it's like you know I guess it's kind of like yeah, this generation really sort out online or whatever. Yeah, I'm not really into it either, but what I've been doing is like reading a book, the a volume of it. Cause I, there's like on the Itazura Neko library, there's like all nine volumes in audiobook as well. So I've been doing like, as the blue people, people call it, immersion listening with it, where you just kind of like listen to the audiobook and just like, I guess, glaze your eyes over the text as well. Um, which I, I do like sometimes, but not that much. And then after I've like finished an, the book, I'll like watch up until there and it kind of is nice to like confirm uh did I picture it the right way I guess and it's like really nice um because I guess like the most common thing to do is you watch the show first and then after that you read the book and it's already way more comprehensible because it's like you're not really piecing together the scene you're just remembering the stuff you already saw um but it's nice doing it the mm -hmm. other way as well um yeah <laughs> yeah that makes sense so the first thing that uh, I wanted to talk about is, I guess, the ego and language learning. Um, and with Chinese, like, are you feeling a little bit more like separated from, uh, I guess, your ability and your persona, I guess? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't really have an ego related to Chinese because I suck at Chinese. So it's kind of impossible to have, to have an ego related to my ability. I mean... But I mean, when you sucked at Japanese, I think like, I think you still had the thing of like, oh, well, I'm learning Japanese, you know, or something like that. Yeah, that was, well, yeah, when I was learning Japanese, well, I was kind of delusional from the start because I started off taking traditional classes like most people and they got me nowhere. But because I was the best in my class and when, when I talked to Japanese people, they would give me like, oh, Nihongo Jozu, whatever. I actually thought that I was pretty good for a foreigner. So I already had an ego and I had no ability. Then I discovered AJAT and realized that actually I completely sucked, but I still had an ego just for the fact that I understood language acquisition and all the other learners I that I knew didn't. So it was like, oh, I'm already infinitely above you because <laughs> I've like transcended to the next dimension pretty much. And I mean, like you're, not, you're I, not even that wrong, like to a certain degree, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but it's not something to be egotistical about. Yeah, it's definitely not. Like you, you, you're just lucky that you happen to stumble across that or happen to have had the right experiences that let you be open-minded to that. Yeah. But anyway, when I actually started age out, I was delusional again, because I had the Dunning Kruger curve where I would try to convince myself that I was understanding more than I really was. Uh, and so th there was that. So in Japanese, I did kind of have an ego for, from the start for no reason. But now that I've been through all my experiences with Japanese and I understand the depths of language acquisition, it's very clear to me that I completely suck at Chinese. Like, like I actually have moments where I realize I'm studying Chinese where if I didn't have my experience with Japanese, I don't think I would believe that it's actually possible to get that good because it's like, it's so hard. You understand so little. It's even when you do understand, it's still so fuzzy and it feels so different than the way that yeah. the language that you're fully fluent in feels. So, I mean, it's actually so, so easy yeah. to forget as well. Cause like I actually, at my university, there was like these free lunchtime Japanese lessons. And then like, I was like, well, I can't just let them, you know, teach people random shit. Like, you know, I kind of just want to at least like 
make a difference by kind of telling at least some people because like i kind of just wish that i had found out about everything earlier on and so i guess there's the element of just like you know you, you want to be that person who is like there f- uh because you wish there was somebody there for you when you wanted ha wow this is a hard idea to express <laughs> do you know what i'm trying to say though it's like you wish that somebody yeah, had given yeah. you certain advice so you want to be that person for someone else um yeah i mean that's basically why i started my youtube channel <laughs> yeah um and then it's like trying to explain like some of these concepts to people but then because you can't put yourself back in the position of not understanding these concepts it's really hard to convey them to people because they have no basis for it i can like yeah it's pretty weird yeah i mean that's something that anyone who goes through this intense language learning process is probably going to experience it's just uh yeah really frustrating because you who you know that you understand something that they don't and you see that their misunderstanding is negatively affecting them yet there's just nothing you can do t- to have them understand your perspective and that's just the reality is this is kind of something you have to come to on your own and so you can't really just make someone understand it usually and of course we you know you'll have varying degrees of success but i think ultimately that's why i turned to youtube and let the people come to me was because then i could I could actually have an outlet for this desire to try to spread what I learned and help other people benefit from my experience in a, in a reasonable way because they would be people who already were open-minded or already had at least determined that maybe there was something for them to learn here, you know? Yeah, definitely. But I mean, obviously, like, you're probably still feeling the effects of uh, the way that you used to act online uh, back in the days. Well, yeah. You mean like when I was a douche? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I definitely feel the effects because there's people who first came into contact with me when I was a douche back then, and then like decided in their mind, oh, this person is a douche, and then they've never listened to anything I've said after that because why would they listen to me? I'm a douche, yeah. and so they never get the opportunity to see that I've changed my outlook on a lot of things. So I definitely feel the f- effects of that. And also sometimes I'm just accidentally still a douche. It's just, you know, <laughs> they're deep, deep-seated <laughs> habits. Like, yeah, I mean, I think I'm getting better, but I still regularly, like, do things so that I look back on, like, the next day, and I'm like, oh, man, that was, I should have done that. That was, like, lapse of mindfulness. That was, but I think, like, the fact oops. that you're at least thinking that is definitely a step in the right direction, because I think maybe back then it, it took you months or, like, a long time to be able to, I guess, see that those kind of actions weren't the kind of person that you wanted to be. And it's like, at least now you're making an effort to, uh, yeah, it's like something that I also try to do or that that's the kind of person that I respect and that I want to be is like, I guess, accountability and like holding yourself um, up to the standards of like the kind of person you want to be. Yeah, and I mean, most of the time, even in the moment when I'm doing something that's still immature like that, I know that I'm doing it, but I just can't help myself. Yeah. You know, which, yeah. which yeah, when is I, actually a good thing. When I was in high school as well, like I'd have these moments of like, oh, do you want to hear this song that I wrote or whatever? And it's like, you can tell in the moment that they don't want to like, I don't know, listen to a whole bunch of stuff you made or just like whatever. But then it's like, because you're so like desperate for an outlet, you kind of just go like, yeah, well, like, yeah, I don't care. Right. I think like that's actually a hard thing in Japanese with like, you know, reading the kooky or whatever is it's like, I think as Westerners, we kind of have that instinct to just like, oh, well, I need to share it with somebody, you know, like regardless of really what the other person thinks. And like, that's, I don't know, a hard thing to phase out. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we all like have a, a desire or maybe even a need to be understood and be accepted and and things like that. But, but I mean, I think overall, if you can be aware that that's what you're doing, that's still a big step up because yeah. like I heard this one framework one time that when it comes to changing your behavior for the better, when you first start off out, you're, you're doing the, the bad behavior and you're, un, you're unaware of it. So you don't even know you're doing it. And then the next step up is you're still doing the bad behavior, but you're aware that you're, that you're doing it. And then the next step up is you actually change the behavior to a better behavior, but it takes a lot of conscious effort. So you're like aware that you're consciously changing your behavior. And then it gets to the point where it's second nature and you just do that by default. And I mean, you don't even have to think about it. So it's almost like you're same, unaware of you doing the right thing. Isn't that almost like the same thing as language acquisition, where it's like, at first you're not aware that you don't know a word because you can't hear it. And then you hear the word and then you're like, wow, that's a word. 
it's that word that I don't know. And then you get to the point where it's like, oh, it's that word. What was that word again? Oh, it's that one. And then you can recall the meaning of it. And then you get to the stage where you don't have to think about it. And it's just obvious. Yeah, yeah, I'd say, yeah, it pretty much fits just like that. And and on just like with language acquisition, once you realize that you that there's this word that you don't know, that's the biggest jump. That's the biggest leap. Once you get to that point, it's pretty much already, you know, set in stone that you're going to end up learning the word. It's undeniable because now every time it comes up, you're going to notice it. And it's the same thing. Like once you realize you have this bad behavior, you identify it and every single time you're, you're aware of it, then that means you're going to have a lot of opportunities to to work with it and slowly yeah. figure out how to change it's it, almost so. like just how many opportunities you give yourself to have that thought because i almost feel like with japanese or whatever when i see a word it's like whoa i thought this exact thing like nine months ago because i haven't seen that word in nine months and it's like it's really weird it's like just how many times you i i guess like reactivate that pathway um i suppose like that's one of the biggest reasons why i would encourage people to give i don't know hardcore language learning uh, a shot is just that it's a really good model for a lot of things in like the way that you use your attention and like if you can just get used to it and get into the habit of like uh i don't know noticing these things um it's definitely something that if you take to other parts of your life um you know it opens up some doors for you yeah i'd say that's true but it's probably similar to any skill though really it's just i think mastery is really the the thing that can really grow you as a person you know and so it's just whatever you choose well not whatever but there's a lot of things you could choose where if you take it really far you're going to end up learning a lot of the same lessons yeah i mean i think there's some unique stuff with language learning because uh, like being able to draw 127 stroke kanji or whatever <laughs> well yeah but i mean it's a little different than a lot of things because it's all already there and it's just about how do you get that thing that's already there inside of you and integrated within you yeah because then you at least you have other a, things a, are more about creating things out of nothing yeah because it's like then you have like a solid frame of reference to like know that you're not delusional because like, especially in musicians or whatever you see a lot of people who they will never realize how like low on the dunning kruger curve they are because it's subjective and they can justify any like bullshit that they come up with by saying, yeah, well, I meant for it to be like that. You know, you can be like the most uh, incompetent person and you can just like use free will and self-expression as like a way to justify it all away. And with language yeah, that's learning, it's like point. because you have uh, native speakers to compare yourself to, it's like even if you are delusional and you don't realize how much you suck, everyone else who's like fluent or whatever does. So it's like at least there's that frame of reference. Yeah, it is pretty objective. That is kind of nice. I think that might be what a, something that I liked about language learning because I, I always liked having an objective standard of how do I get better? Have I improved? You know, I mean, you say like mastery is where, I mean, at least the pursuit of mastery is how you learn so many lessons. But also, like, I guess the pursuit of mastery in itself of just like, oh well, I want to be a master of this. I feel like because you're not a master of it, you don't know what it means to be a master of it. And something I've been thinking about is like when you have a dream or you have an ambition, right? To turn that into reality, it's almost like you're exchanging your your fantasy for it. So you have to like give away your your dream in order to get something that's actually quite mundane in return. Um, and obviously, like with the the realized like actualized version of that that skill or that thing you can actually do stuff with it and you know in an objective sense it's better but it's never going to hold up to the the dream <laughs> you know yeah except i don't know if you necessarily have to set out on the pursuit of mastery with a, a kind of dream i mean i think a lot of people do but i could see now that like even with with chinese for example or if i started learning how to program or whatever i probably wouldn't have as much as of a dream because i already know that I didn't know what it was going to be like. So I would yeah. just kind of be venturing into the unknown, hoping that something interesting would come out of it. Well, I guess like that's a pretty good way to put it. But it's also just like, say you, you really want to try eating this kind of food or whatever. And then as soon as you've actually eaten it, it kind of takes away like the appeal of like eating a new mysterious food, if you know what I mean. So it's like, uh it's hard to explain exactly what i mean but yeah uh, yeah no i mean i know what you mean but yeah what say you've gone through that process of hearing about this new interesting food you've never had before eating it and then realizing that it wasn't as amazing as you 
had envisioned ahead of time. And you do that a bunch of times. Well, you're going to get to the point where even if you hear about this cool new fruit, you're not really going to buy into the idea that it's going to be that amazing because you already know it's probably not going to be, you know? So you yeah. can kind of learn the lesson on a meta level and then kind of transcend that me- that dynamic, I think. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, uh, I feel like I have done that with language learning and in a way it definitely affects my motivation because like I said, I don't have that sense that, oh, once I learn Chinese, it's going to be so cool. I'm going to be trilingual. Or, I mean, those thoughts arise, but I immediately see through them and realize, no, it's not going to be like that. It's going to be exactly the same as it is now. So I have to just be satisfied with the process. And it does make it harder to keep going because it, there's not the sense that there's some pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You really do have to view it as, well, this is just my life. I'm a language learner, so I'm learning a language. And yeah, there'll be some cool stuff, but I'm always it's always going to feel like how it feels now on a meta level. But I mean, like, there's also the fact that, like, a language is a tool. And I think you said this before that, like, w- say you do get to native level and you're just completely perfect, right? So in yourself, you might feel like that was something that's, you need to be aiming for that. And I know, like, especially earlier in your journey, like, you were thinking, yeah, well, if you don't get there, then you're a fucking chump and there's no point or whatever. And obviously, like, that's not realistic. But, like, say, hypothetically, you did get there. It's like, wow, now you're just the same as a Japanese person and you have no other redeeming, like, skills or whatever. So it's like, when it comes down to it, languages are, like, it's a tool to do stuff. If you're not doing stuff with it, it's like, you know, it's like a showpiece. It's like a party trick. Yeah, yeah, I think that's def- that's definitely true. Although, for me, like with Chinese, one thing that I think would be, like one thing idea that kind of appeals to me is just being able to take in information through multiple languages. Because each language presents information in a totally different way, you know? So yeah. I do like the fact that I can read a book in English, I can read a book in Japanese, and ex- have that those two different ex- experiences. And so it would be cool to have a third stream of that I mean, again, I'm still doing something with it. I'm taking in information, so you could say that. But I mean, I relate to you because it's like the flavor of like taking in information with Japanese, especially like written. I think spoken, you, you can become like very numb to how it feels different very quickly. But especially like with the written language, it feels very, very different. Yeah, yeah, and I think Chinese feels like totally different than both Japanese and English. So there's that kind of curiosity of what would it be like to completely take in information through this this language that has no conjugations and and almost tends to follow the minimum information principle and expressing basic ideas and all these things. It, it does seem like it would be interesting. And I do get a kick out of it when I just read a sentence in Chinese and understand it. And it, the feeling of it, like the way that my brain is being used is different than for Japanese or English. Yeah. I mean, I think that will mostly wear off because it's like, I mean, it still happens with Japanese for sure. And even learning Japanese has even helped me feel that way for English in a way. Cause it makes me realize yeah, that cause you have a frame of reference I am so now. numb to English. Yeah. Yeah. It's like English is arbitrary. So once you realize that you can look at it through a new light and realize, Oh, that's interesting. English is like this. I never really noticed that before. Like, yeah, it, I mean, it doesn't, you realize it doesn't have to be the, the way it is. It just happens to be that way. I mean, that's actually something I've been feeling a lot is like, I ended up just glancing at a newspaper the other day and it was like the first time other than like my phone or something or like reading discord or whatever that I actually like read English and I was like whoa seeing like in a what do you call it like a, a sans font I don't know what which one is what this one that looks like Times New Roman or whatever like reading mm-hmm. English in that kind of a font it's like whoa it feels like so English <laughs> it's like it really tripped me out <laughs> and I guess like you can only have that experience when you know what it's like for it to not feel like English and then yeah, it's definitely something. But it's like one of the things that really tripped me out with Japanese is all of like the punctuation and like all of the rules that I just thought were universal weren't universal. And that was just an assumption I made because I had nothing to disprove that it was an assumption. I just kept on believing that just like, oh, if a word goes over a line, you have to put a hyphen so that you can tell that where the word ends. And then, you know, you can go to the next line and know that, you know, there's still half the word that you have to like you know, still read. And in Japanese, you don't do that. You can be halfway through a compound word and it just goes over the line like nothing happened. It's like, that really tripped me out. Yeah. Or like, yeah, it's like so many little things, I guess. I mean, I remember thinking, I was actually surprised that Japanese still uses commas and exclamation points in something like a period in a kind of similar way. I mean, I don't. I think that's relatively new in, in Japanese history. Yeah, right? like question marks Japanese, and stuff I think definitely came the, from uh, yeah. like the American influence. Yeah, I think that originally Japanese was written with almost no punctuation, which is e- even crazier. But I think it was still like maru and stuff like that, right? I'm not sure, actually. I think 
Well, actually, no, I don't think there was. Whoa. Because the other thing to remember is that in classical Japanese, there were more ver verb conjugations. And there was basically a verb conjugation that was only used when it was the end of a sentence. To simply, I mean, it's a little more complicated than that, but basically, yeah. So it was very clear when a sentence ended because a verb would be conjugated into the specific form. So you didn't really need periods. But that form was lost in modern Japanese, which would make it a lot harder to write modern Japanese without periods. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know that. <laughs> I mean, classical Japanese is definitely something that interests me. And I think I'm, I want to at least like um, get the basics of it down at some point, just because like I think the same reasons as you is like because it pops up in modern Japanese as well. It's just like, whoa, what was that thing? You know, it kind of yeah. like it kind of annoys you that it's like, wow, there's this whole other like um infrastructure like beneath the surface that i'm not seeing and like i think like that's one of the things of like being a language learner is like you can be the kind of person where y you complain and you're like oh like why is this language so complicated this is so crappy why do i have to like just thinking about like the word like toru right where it's like to take and it's like you can write that so many different ways and they all have a different nuance and they're all used in like its specific like context and it's like you get the kind of person who's like wow this language sucks why do i have to know all this or you get the kind of person who it's like that excites you to a certain extent and it kind of pisses you off that you don't know that and i think like to be successful with learning japanese at least i don't know about other languages but you kind of have to have that kind of personality otherwise you're just gonna have a really bad time yeah that's an interesting point of view i mean there's something else i want to say with that but just with classical japanese in particular i think yeah you definitely don't need to do it if you're just be trying to be practical and you're like i want to use japanese to function i want to be able to read modern books talk to modern people function in japan definitely don't need it by any means but i think that it's a really enriching intellectual exercise and that's pretty much what i think about it uh, same as, thing as like, pitch accent really no i'd say pitch accent is way more practical honestly yeah like learning even a little bit of pitch accent will practically improve your japanese in many ways and classical Japanese literally won't. Like, it will not improve your <laughs> Japanese in any practical way whatsoever. Except it, except if you want to, like, show off that you have obscure knowledge to other Japanese people, which probably isn't even a good idea because then you just look like a show-off. So... Yeah, it's a bit KY. I mean, it's like, for me, I can read certain things in modern Japanese and just know, oh, hey, I know that really this comes from this classical Japanese structure and it's not arbitrary. And it's cool. But it doesn't do anything. I already could know. I already knew what it meant before I knew the etymology. So it's like it, you know? knowing like Greek and like coming into English and like going like, oh, well, that comes from that. And obviously, like, you know, I mean, actually, that's one interesting thing about English is that I feel like we're so blind to etymology unless you like go out of your way to think about it or find out about it. Whereas in at least exactly. in Japanese, it's like it's so there. And I I'll go into that afterwards. Uh, but yeah, is there anything else you want to yeah, say? Yeah, I about think that's it? an interesting point, and it actually makes me want to learn Latin in a way. Because it is, like, I, I do enjoy having this different perspective of Japanese. And it, it was just an interesting intellectual exercise. It just, it expanded the scope even further. Like, you know, you were talking about how you have a different perspective on English now because you've learned something that's not English. Yeah. Well, learning a different version of Japanese gave me a new perspective on modern Japanese. And it made me realize how different it could be in subtle ways. Well, isn't that and also the that cool was, thing about Chinese? Is like, it, it still does yeah. that, I guess. Yeah, totally. It does that in, in a lot of ways. Because, again, yeah, it totally changes my perspective on Japanese because so much of Japanese is, is Chinese. But, like, also, I think, I mean, one of the one of my motivations for learning Mandarin is because I think it would be cool to learn classical Chinese. And, I mean, I'm not try to become fluent in it to the point where I could just, like, read old scripture or whatever. But, you know, learn about the same amount that I know of classical Japanese so that with a dictionary, I could work through an old text and at least see what's going on on yeah. a structural level because like especially because i'm really interested in you know buddhism and like zen buddhism and other spiritual traditions and uh, there's a lot of like zen poetry that's written in classical japanese and it's kind of funny because like just the other day i was actually reading a, a a book that was talking about zen and he quoted this one really famous zen poem uh it's it's like it was about the gateless gate if anyone knows about about zen uh there's this term the gateless gate which is like the gate that you go through to become enlightened and it's called the gateless gate because really you're already enlightened you just don't know it according to their philosophy or whatever but uh it was like a pretty fleshed out poem and so i was curious what do the original chinese look like so i looked it up and it was literally just four yoji jukugo in a, in a row it was like the whole poem 
Like, <laughs> I mean, they weren't actually Yoji Jukuko, but it was like four kanji per line for four lines. And that was the entire poem. And, and it was like full fleshed out sentences in the English translation. And so I was like, whoa, that's cool. And I kind of like looked up the characters that I didn't know and saw what was going on structurally. And I was like, that's, that's cool. That's dope. And yeah, yeah definitely made me want to actually study classical Chinese. And of course, the best way to study classical Chinese is through modern Mandarin. So that's something I want to do, even though it's not practical, right? It's just uh, an interesting intellectual exercise. Like, I also think it would be interesting to study quantum mechanics one day, just <laughs> for fun, basically, yeah. to un- well, increase yeah, I, my I understanding definitely been of the thinking world. about that as well. Like, I actually, so I don't know if you know about, like, Kindle Unlimited, and, like, there was there's, like, a month trial you can do. And then using the DDRMing stuff, I kind of just used it to cheese the system to get a whole bunch of books that I was interested in. And, like, mm-hmm. I'd really be interested in learning about kanbu and stuff like that. I guess, like, through the lens of Japanese, because, I don't know, thinking about learning Chinese right now just doesn't seem worth it. <laughs> and it seems a bit insane. So, yeah. Um, and, like, obviously, there's no real practical reason to do that. But I think, like, at some stage, and I'm not trying to say, like, I'm at that stage yet, obviously, but, like, you can't really draw a distinction between language learning and, like, becoming knowledgeable within that language, I guess. If that makes sense. So it's like, if you can't do maths in Japanese, it's like, that's a huge flaw, I guess. <laughs> you know, it's like, you want to come across as a well-learned adult, but the only way to do that is to know how to do all of the, the well-learned adult stuff in Japanese as well. You can't just go like, oh, well, I can do it in English. I mean, you can, and people are going to give you a free pass because, you know, nobody really gives a fuck. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So what I've actually been thinking yeah, I mean- about... Yeah, sorry, you go. <laughs> well, I mean, actually, I, I also, there was a point. I was going to say I went through a phase, but in reality, the phase only lasted like two days. But I was going to, I bought a book on Kanbun in Japanese. Well, I didn't buy it. It was at my college library. But I was going to try to learn classical Chinese through Japanese because I also was like, classical Chinese is cool. I can't wait until I already know Mandarin. But it was way harder than I thought it was going to be. So I immediately quit. But <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. you can't do that. I mean, Japanese people did that for hundreds of years, right? They learned how to read classical Chinese through Japanese, pretty much. And they got to the point where they could literally just read classical Chinese. They pronounce it differently in their head, but they could still read and write in it. Yeah. And so it's cool. possible. But I actually heard that right now, if you're Japanese and you want to be a scholar of classical Chinese, it's pretty much considered a given that you're going to have to learn Chinese or you're just not going to be able to compete with the Chinese people. So now Japanese people who want to become Kanbun scholars basically all study abroad in China and learn modern Mandarin. But for a long time, that wasn't the case. And it would, they just thought that they could just do the Kundoku thing where you learn how to read classical Jap- classical Chinese through Japanese and then <laughs> they just be, do scholarly work through that. I think there's also like a, a 2chan thing or like I think there's also a subreddit or whatever where it's like Japanese people making of like fake Chinese articles or whatever <laughs> just, you know, in Chinese, Japanese, or I don't know what you'd call it, but yeah, I didn't know about that. I know one one time one of my Japanese friends told me that there was some th- thing that was hayatte doing, like something that was getting popular where you just write fake Chinese, like using all kanji. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I mean. Just for fun, like like girl, high school girls and stuff would like do <laughs> to each other. That's pretty but, funny. So yeah, but what yeah. I've been thinking about doing, what I have been doing is I've been watching some of the NHK Cool Cool Chords Our stuff just to like learn about maths. And obviously like, it's actually funny, like before I ended up going through the NHK route, I ended up trying to pick up one of those like four adults, like rediscovering high school maths kind of things. But it was way, way harder than I expected because obviously it assumes that you already learned it all once in Japanese. And so it's not really catered to like, being very i plus one um hmm. so that that sucked um but yeah what i'm really planning on doing or what i'm i want to work towards is being able to study for my degree in japanese so it doesn't feel like i need to compromise on immersing to study and there was a stage where i was also thinking about like signing up for mext and like doing my degree in japanese but to be honest like i think it's a huge commitment to go and go like yeah well i'm gonna go for a five-year degree in this country, I don't even really know if I'll enjoy being there because, you know, you haven't lived there. So, you know, it's really putting all your eggs in one basket. I don't really think that's a very smart move. Um, but yeah, I'm going to see how that goes. Uh, and hopefully next time we speak, uh, 
I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to speak to you pretty soon. So maybe the next time we do like an interview kind of thing, <laughs> then uh, I'll have some success with that. Um, but yeah, yeah like, I think it, Patrick it, tried to do that for, to a certain extent. He was studying electrical engineering, I think. Yeah, me too. And he studied a lot of stuff in Japanese. He, uh, he found a lot of textbooks and stuff. Like I think made for college students in Japan. That's cool. That uh, I can't remember how far he took it, but yeah, it's it's like if you're trying to do it in a in your own country, then it's it's pretty difficult because you basically have to learn two terms for everything. You yeah, know, and yeah, that's, that's definitely head. the the thing that has been. But I mean, just in terms of like doing exercises or whatever, it's like at least it's more fun. Like, uh, like I'm a Japanese nerd, so. It kind of gives me at least motivation for why I should be studying. Um, and it's kind of just inherently fun. I mean, at least now, maybe I'll go through, I'll expire the honeymoon period and it'll just suck. Um, that's very, very possible. And if that happens, I'll just, you know, move on with my life. But uh, right now, it just feels like something to try at least. But also, like, one thing about Japanese is that, like, technical terms are a little bit easier than in English. Just going back to the fact that, like, Japanese, yeah, you can see true. the etymology. So it's like, you know, what is uh, parabola mean in English? Like, what, you know, it's just a word, you know? And I'm sure, like, there are a lot of people who do know it, and maybe if I Googled it, I'd kick myself because it's obvious. But when I see the word parabola, it doesn't, it's not inherently meaningful. You know, it could be anything. If I didn't know what it was. Whereas yeah, in Japanese, it's like, it's basically, like you can see it. And, yeah. Because English speakers aren't fluent in Latin and Greek, but Chinese, but Japanese people are fluent in kanji, and if you speak Japanese, you become fluent in kanji, so... You can't see that. But a funny insight I had the other day is all the all those areas where Japanese is more convenient than English, they almost all come directly from Chinese. Yeah. Like that that aspect of where well, that's definitely true. Learning technical terms of Japanese is straight up way easier than it is in English. And another thing is that, you know, in English, we have stress accent. And when you have these super big compound words, sometimes it's hard to tell exactly where the stress is because the stress will change. Whereas that pretty much doesn't happen because all these terms are pretty much just hey bon in japanese and if they're chinese then you just know the tone because the tone never changes <laughs> from like compound to compound so yeah it's just straight up way easier to learn technical terms in japanese and chinese it's actually kind of funny like when i was in like seventh grade what me and my friend did which is kind of like you know chuni bio in a way and i'm just thinking like in Japanese, you see a lot of people who it's like you're proud of being able to like read uh, or be able to write like a really hard kanji. And like what a friend of mine was like doing was he like remember how to write like uh, deoxyribonucleic acid, which is like the full thing for DNA and stuff. I just think it's funny because you don't really see that in English as much. But it's like, you know, within my friend group, there were at least people like that. <laughs> yeah, I made an Anki card for that a like, long time ago. Just where it was like, what does DNA stand for? Deoxyribonucleic acid. No. Had a had a card for that. I don't know why. Uh, I think maybe it would come up in some situation. I would make me sound smart, but yeah, that's pretty chuny bio, probably. <laughs> yeah. Uh, something but else. Another point that you brought up. Um, yeah. When you were mentioning about like toru in Japanese, for example, how it has a million meanings. Yeah. Like, this is an insight that I, I had uh, not too long ago learning Chinese. That is one of those things where if I could truly communicate it to other learners, it would save them a ton of time and effort. But I think it's something that you ultimately have to learn through your own experience to really fully get it. But of course, there's words like that in Chinese as well. I think there's words like that in every language. It's like this, these group of words that are really common, but they have just like 50 different uses. And it's really confusing. There's a bunch of these in Chinese as well. Like shang is one of them, for example. It's just written with the character for ue, like above. And it can just mean like anything, pretty much. It's just like a, a verb that can mean a million things. And it's really confusing. And it can has all these usage, usages. But basically, I make zero effort to try to comprehend it. Like, I don't... Like, I've never even read the full description of all the different things it can mean. And when it's in a specific sentence, even if I don't fully get it, I don't worry about it. I pretty much just ignore it. Because I see that the only way I'm truly going to get it is through, like, huge exposure over a long period of time. And it's going to slowly become clear. And every any conscious effort I put into trying to grasp it is just wasted effort. And so, it's just completely, you know, not a cause of stress. Where it could be. I could see if I was a traditional Chinese learner, this would probably cause me a ton of stress. Because I'd constantly be trying to wrap my, my head around what are all the usages, what is, how, which one is... Is it being used in this particular situation? Like in this situation, is is it this tone or that tone or whatever? Whereas I just 
just admit like, oh yeah, that's gonna be something I don't get for a long while. And once you admit that, it actually doesn't get in the way because it's like, yeah. if you just assume that it, that verb could mean anything, then you, and you just focus on the object of the verb and the context, you can pretty much get the gist of what's being said anyway. And like, for example, a Japanese like toru, kakeru, maybe even the difference between wa and ga, this is something that I wouldn't even worry about for probably the first year because I just it's just something that you can't fully get until you're already pretty good and trying to wrap your head around it intellectually is pretty much completely meaningless to the process of yeah. actually acquiring it directly. Yeah, so. I think it's actually funny. Like I've only really been able to understand like what kakeru means like within like the last couple of months, and it's just one of those things like you kind of just have to know how it's used before you understand what it means. I guess. Yeah, because like, here's the thing, like with kakeru and with toru, is that you if you look it up on Jisho and you see that there's like a million different definitions and they all seem to be totally different, but once you fully acquire it, you can kind of see from a bird's eye view the common thread between all of those different definitions. Yeah. And then it like makes complete to intuitive sense because it's like, oh yeah, I could see you you could like kakeru glasses, you could like kakeru a scarf, like you could kakeru your your jacket on the hook. Cause that's kinda, you see I this just common wish thread. like that instead of like bilingual definitions being like oh the, well this is a word let's give a whole bunch of different words that all mean the same thing it'd just be so much better if they just gave a short explanation of how the word is actually used in japanese or if they just like fucking translated the the, the monolingual definition the monolingual definition yeah it would just be like so much better for everyone <laughs> yeah i've thought of that before it's it's pretty i wonder why they don't do that i maybe it's just laziness or it's just that's just not the way it's been done so it's no one how thinks it is. to do it but another point on definitions is that a lot of times, like if there's a word in Chinese, like I've been using the MI dictionary add-on and I only have Chinese to English and Chinese to Chinese definitions in the dictionary add-on. I don't have a Chinese to Japanese dictionary, although I found a dictionary file and I'm going to try to get Yoga to convert it for me. <laughs> but he thinks it's not a good use of time because no one else is going to be using a Chinese to Japanese dictionary and he doesn't want to <laughs> do it if only I'm going to use it. But anyway... Uh, on my phone, I have a really good uh, Chinese to Japanese dictionary. I actually have two Chinese to Japanese dictionaries. And so a lot of times I'll just use the Chinese to English dictionary because that's the one that's in the dictionary add-on. And if I use the dictionary add-on, it's really easy to make cards quickly. But sometimes it will just not really make sense, the, def the English definition. It just won't click. So I'll look it up on my phone and it will be completely different. It'll have a completely different definition. Yeah. And it's kind of like, what the heck? And a lot of times the Japanese one is just way easier to understand. And I think that's just because it's a higher quality dictionary and Japanese is it's easier to describe Chinese with Japanese than with English just because of the kanji and stuff inherently. And so, yeah, a lot of times it's a really eye opening experience. But there's been a couple of times where the English definition and the Japanese definition both are completely different and they're both pretty much wrong. <laughs> and it takes me a while to realize this so yeah like dictionaries suck is kind of my conclusion or at least bilingual yeah. dictionaries like, they I mean, like, suck so I'll still use bilingual definitions like if I'm immersing because on my phone like I really don't like using the the Epwing viewer on my phone I'll use it like if I have to make a card while I'm on, or if I see something I really want to make a card for while I'm like out but otherwise like I'm just too lazy and I think like if you want to have success with hardcore language learning, it's like you have to kind of like give yourself some slack and just be okay with being lazy sometimes. So like if I'm just like watching uh, anime, I mean, actually, but with the dictionary add-in, like if I'm on my computer, it's like there's almost no excuse. So I'll just, you know, uh, use Dajiri or whatever. Um, especially like with Kindle as well. It's like, oh, it's so easy to um, look at monolingual definitions. And I was like, if I look at it, it's like really technical and whatever. Then I was like, you know, First, I'll, I'll go to a different um, uh, monolingual and see if it's also really technical and hard to understand. If, if, if it is, then I'll just look at English. Well, uh, sometimes I'll also just like just go, oh, well, this word's probably not even that important anyway, so I just go on. But uh, it's really just like, you know, whatever you feel like in the moment, at least for me. Yeah, wait, by the way, are you on Android or iOS? Android. Your phone? Well, I'm sure that you can get just like a Daijidin app or something or a Shinmeikai app. And yeah, that would be easier to stuff, use than, you know, <laughs> well, I mean, I, for the longest time, like basically when I first went monolingual, when I was looking things up in the wild, I'd still use the bilingual dictionary pretty much for the same reason you said. It's like, just because you can use the bilingual dictionary, that doesn't mean 
it's still way that it doesn't mean it's not way harder and takes way more effort than just using the bilingual dictionary. So when you're in the middle of reading a book, a lot of times you're just like, oh, I'm in the middle of the story. I don't want to stop and decode yeah, yeah, exactly. the definition. I just want to go. So for a long time, that was what I did, probably for like six months after initially going monolingual, is I'd make all my cards with monolingual definitions. When I was reading on the wild, in the wild, I would use the bilingual dictionary. But after I did that for about six months, and I got more comfortable with the monolingual dictionary, I started to more and more look up words in Digidine when I was just reading. And I used the Digidine app on my phone. I've, I had an, Actually, I didn't even have a smartphone back then. I had an iPod Touch. I had an iPod Touch and I downloaded the Digidine app. It did cost like 20 bucks, but I've probably used that for hundreds of hours. So it was definitely worth it. And yeah, okay. again, at, at the like beginning, my currency in my country is really, really bad. So for me, it would cost more like $50. It's just like, I, I don't really want to justify that, especially when I have the Epwings on my phone as well, you know? <laughs> I see. But even so, if you were going to actually use it all the time, it well, could I be use my Kindle a good mostly, investment. so it's like I have it all there. It's mostly just like when I'm watching stuff, I understand most of what I'm watching anyway. So it's usually like I'll use it like twice a day. The bilingual definitions, and even I then, see. it's so it's like not really a big deal. Because yeah, like, anyway, I'm, what, I'm pretty comfortable like, with the bilingual definite, bilingual dictionary at this point, unless it's technical, I guess. You mean the monolingual dictionary? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, because I, I mean, I just think this is an, an important point to touch on because I, I've seen a lot of people think that the mono tra tra monolingual transition is like an on-off switch. Like, oh, now I'm monolingual. I can never use the bilingual dictionary again. Where, uh, where if you actually take that mindset, you're probably going to really struggle and probably end up just quitting the monolingual dictionary because yeah. it's a gradual, it's a skill that you cultivate gradually over time. And so for me, like, like I said, for a while, I would only when I made cards. Then I would only do it when I had energy towards the beginning of the day. And I'd also wouldn't do it if it seemed like a super technical term. Like I could tell it was the name of a planet or something. I would just look it up in the English dictionary. And more and more, I shifted towards never using the bilingual dictionary to the point where I'd only use it once every couple of days if it was like a super technical term that probably had an exact English equivalent. Yeah. Then I would use it. But uh, that, that was really important, I think, because, well, first of all, well, actually, never mind. This doesn't have to do with the monolingual dictionary, but I'm actually really fast at typing Japanese on my phone. And I think it's literally from looking words up in the dictionary that I got really fast at so typing do you Japanese. Use, I use like, doing like flick. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. And I'm super fast and intuitive at it. Like, I, I, it's like my thumb just knows where to go. And I never texted that much in Japanese on my phone. So I, it must be from just looking things up in the dictionary. But I guess I could have one of the bilingual dictionary as well. But also, it's just like, it takes you to the next level of comfort when you're when you're looking at monolingual dictionary definitions multiple times every single day, like multiple times every single hour, you know, where com as compared to only when you make cards. So it's a good thing to move towards eventually. Yeah, like just looking at my search history, it looks like it's usually like four per day. And this kind of stuff I was looking up was like seiski and kansu and stuff like that. But yeah, like... Yeah. Uh, like, I remember there was one really hard one, not because I didn't really understand the words, but just because I didn't know if what I was understanding was correct. And I think, like, that's definitely something. It's, like, the ambiguity of just, like, well, I'm understanding something, or, like, something is popping into my head, but I don't know if it's, like, what the thing is supposed to be. Like, you know that in China, there's the the traditional aging system where everybody turns, uh, like, the, the, the age changes on Chinese New Year, and all kids are, like, one years old when they're born. Oh, yeah, like so what I, they do in korea or something yeah so i made a card for that right oh, <laughs> Kazoi Doshi, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly um and it's like the definition of that was really hard or it's like it wasn't that it was hard it's just like i read it and i was like i don't know if i'm understanding this or not and it's like it's kind of an abstract concept um to a certain extent um but yeah i'll just use english <laughs> yeah but by the way i'll give you a tip that took me a long time to realize yeah sure. sometimes in monolingual definitions you'll have the word man like manzoku no man and it will be like monday something 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 what that means is not kazoitoshi it means the normal way of counting age and uh yeah it took me forever to realize that Ooh. but if you if you ever have a card that has to do with age like i remember like gakure or something there was like the word for the age that people initially enter school or something or actually no that was Gakure was just the age of the age of going to school, and it was like man day from this age to this age, and I for the longest time I was like, what does that mean, man? It's like full, like what? 
And then finally, I, I looked it up and realized that it meant the normal way of counting age that we use in the West. That's not Kazuo Ibushi. So. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, I haven't seen that yet. Uh, if I did, it probably just went over my head. So I'll definitely...